Okay, we would like to start. We are at the beginning of the second session. First, I'd, like, I'd ask uh, Revital, are you here? Would you like to try and uh, give your greeting? Mm. Yeah, I see. Are we still uh, waiting for the greetings from Professor Vital Rafael Vivante, uh, head of the department? She has uh, the problems with uh, her microphone. All right, I make it brief. I, I uh, just read aloud your greeting. Okay, Revital, are you here? The last opportunity for you to to appear here. All right. Okay, Rital, would you like to say something? Ah, no, we can't hear you. No. All right. Uh, so, Rital, uh, I'd read aloud your greeting. Okay. Yes. Uh, so, this is the greeting of, uh, Vita, of Professor Vital Rafael Vivante, the, the head of the Department of Literature of the Jewish people. I'm happy to have this opportunity to greet you at this important event and to welcome you all to the Department of Literature of the Jewish People at Barlan University, Israel. This event, the concluding event of the International Research Group on the History of Russian Israeli Literature. The group has worked throughout this academic year with the support of the rector. This event is the second conference of the program of Jewish Russian literature at the Department of Literature of the Jewish People. I participated in the first conference and attended all the lectures. Of course, I had a translator to help me understand everything. The variety of authors and subjects was both impressive and fascinating. It was a very long day with lectures from the morning until the evening and I'm happy to say that I enjoyed that conference very much. Even though my field of research is medieval literature, that conference made me realize how immense the Russian-Israeli field of literature is, and how much literature was written here over the course of the century, but is not being studied seriously, and with the respect it is due. I realized that Professor Roman Katzman's initiative to open a master's degree track for Russian Israeli literature in the Department of Literature of the Jewish People was a natural and necessary step forward. And for this reason, I supported it totally. Despite the significance of Russian Israeli literature, its history has still not been written, and it is very important for the reader and literature scholar who does not read Russian. The purpose of your project to create a systematic historiography of Russian-Israeli literature is therefore all the more essential for future scholars in this field. I would like to thank Professor Roman Kasman for leading this field in the Department of Literature of the Jewish People and for organizing this event. Thank you. I also extend my sincere thanks to Ms. Inbal Dahan, the excellent coordinator of our department. This is a virtual conference, but as you know, we welcome you all to our department. We do hope that in the near future, we will be able to meet each other in person. Wishing you all an interesting and fruitful event. Thank you very much. All right. And uh, this was the greeting from Professor Rafael Vivante, head of the Department of Literature of the Jewish People. Thank you very much, Vital. And now we're going to open the second session where I'm a moderator. And um, once again, um, I'm asking you to uh, mute your microphones first. Second, we'll hear three uh, presentations, uh, one after another, and then take uh, questions. Um, all right, and in order to ask questions at the end of the session, please uh, raise your hand, please push the button, raise hand. Yeah, or try to just make signs to me. 
Okay. So, our first uh, presenter in this session is Professor Luba uh, Jurgensen from Sorbonne University in Paris. Luba Jurgensen is a French writer, author of several novels and essays, including Three Tales About Germany, whose Russian translation have just been published in Moscow in text publishing house, and a book called Where There Is Danger uh, in Academic Studies Press 2019. She is an editor of the new and complete edition of Journey into the Land of Zeka by Yuli Margolin in French, as well as uh, his Margolin's uh, the Road to the West and the reports on the Rousseau and Eichmann trials. Uh, recent academic publications of uh, Professor Jurgensen include Landscapes of by Memory, uh, which is exhibition catalog from 2000, uh, 2020, and Mirror of the Gulag, the perceptions of Soviet repression in France and Italy, published in 2000. In 19. Professor Jurgensen, the microphone is yours. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for the invitation and uh, uh, for your wonderful project. Um, uh, my title was uh, far too ambitious for a brief uh, presentation. I will only talk about uh, Margolin and uh, even about a very specific aspect of his work, the displacement. I could have entitled my talk uh, Margolin's Journeys or Margolin's Trains. For the theme of the journey uh, links the great stages of Margolin's life childhood, education, alia, deportation to the Gulag, uh, and return. Uh, the aim here is to see how the journey, the displacement, the movement retrospectively produce a narrative construction for thinking of on a life uh, of witness. Uh, journey into the la land of the Zika closed with the image of a train that was taking uh, Margolin away from the camps of Karelia, where he had stayed for five years uh, between uh, 1940 and 1945 toward, toward Altai region in the south of Siberia. This was the end of his concentration, concentration camp journey, which had begun with a ride in a cattle car in a cattle car designated as a walking coffin. The stories in his later book, The Way to the West, Daroga na Zapad, are also punctuated by the incessant sound of wheels, a sound, a sound accompaniment uh, that is inseparable from the historical period marked by massive population movements. It contains, uh, this book contains, um, so the second book contains nine stories that retrace step by step the return of the former prisoner to Palestine between spring and autumn uh, 1946. It was after a year's stay in Slavgorod, a city in the Altai, that Margolin was authorized, authorized to leave the Soviet Union, thank to the agreements of the repatriation of Poles still on uh, Soviet territory. The form of the travel stay tale, which uh, underpinned the testimony of the land of the Zika, remains the narrative ma uh, matrix of this experience restored through the places traveled and taken back from nothingness uh, nothingness by the writing. Uh, Wood, uh, Warsaw, Paris, Marseille, Tel Aviv. Margolin retraces in reverse the path that led him seven years earlier uh, from Palestine, where he had immigrated with his family, to Poland and then to the Gulag camps. 
time regained unfolds through a regained space. This literary pattern is not simply a cultural data linking, linking, linking it to the tradition of the European travel style, tale or allowing us to understand a new form of political violence manifested by an incessant movement. It is also a very personal archaeological approach that aims at reclaiming a sense of existence crushed uh, by the concentration camp experience and the awareness of the destruction that has befallen befell the world. It is interesting to compare this story, uh, so the, the, the path uh, toward the West, uh, to the uh, to another one, the eight chapters of childhood, the beginning of um, an aut autobiography undertaken, undertaken later in the 60s and left unfinished. Uh, the theater of the disaster that struck Central Europe and the Soviet Union at the time of the Second World War is thus superimposed on an intimate scene, uh, the memory of childhood, the world of the shtetl. Uh, the chapters of, uh, on childhood draw a temporality in rivers, that of a late memory in search of the story of origins. In both cases, the narrative starts, starts from geography. The places of childhood refer to an uh, initiatory time that appears in retrospect as a prelude to Margolin's European education, um, allowing, um, allowing us to understand the social and intellectual framework within which uh, the narrative of this fundamental experience will be forged, uh, that of the confrontation of the individual with state violence. Thus, Margolin experiences, uh, Margolin experiences several returns. The journey through uh, a Europe devastated by war is one of them. Just like life in the gulag, liberation is marked by multiple displacements, a historical condition of the deportees, but also a narrative mode of organi organization of past, which for Margolin is con consubstantial <laughs> with his identity as an eternal wanderer. The return as an existence existential category category questions the very condition of the su survivor. Many of those to whom imprisoned, imprisonment has opened up the limitless limitlessness of human degradation will feel that they can never fully return to the living, haunted as they are by the community of the disappeared. Margolin notes, we have left a piece of our hearts in the camps and places of relegation, possessed as we are for forever by the specter of the past, a past that survives in the present. Against the, this modality of non-return, Margolin has two weapons, uh, weapons, which are at the same time two facets of his identity. The first is his militant militant conscience. He intends to act for the living, the army of slaves held in the Soviet camps, and especially for the Jews who could, who could find refuge in Palestine, but also for the whole democratic world threatened by the existence of the camps in the uh, Soviet Union. Zionism is his second uh, bewark, um, because Margolin travels towards a new space, a state to be built, uh, and the places of the past that he, uh, that he surveys are the stages of this. 
movement. Uh, this new journey from Uj to Tel Aviv is a replica of the one uh, made in the uh, 30s to Eretz Israel. Margolin walks in his own footsteps, uh, noting the abyss that now separates him from the one who made the journey for the first time. The broke, brokenness that is at the root of his experience as a sur survivor is some superimposed on another collective experience that of the Alea. The annihilation of the Jews, the awareness of which is one of the essential facts of this new journey, implicitly confirms the validity of the Zionist project and the necessity for the Jews to leave old Europe. In ret retrospect, uh, Zev Jabotinsky, uh, Zev Zab Zev, uh, Jabotinsky appealed to the Jews of Poland on the 9th, 9th of Av, uh, 1938 to leave for Palestine in order to escape the massacre. Uh, that was mm, uh, the massacre that was being prepared uh, and the evacuation plan he tried to put in place for the uh, immigration appear to be political premo premonitions uh, that projected into the future play the role of lessons of history. Margolin, who felt close to the positions of the revisionist party, um, saw in this episode the justification for the radicalism that its leader Jabotinsky was accused of. His concern for the future of the Jews in Palestine is expressed through a rhetoric marked by the Avaronis uh, that it is the Jews themselves in the person of the Zionist, Zionist of Poland who have closed the doors uh, of salvation by refusing to leave the country. In in accordance with the, the Zionist project, it was uh, not only a question of changing the environ environment of Jewish life, but also of changing the Jew himself. The destruction of the traditional Jewish, Jewish world began, in fact, before the arrival of the Germans with the First World War, war the Russian Revolution and the Civil War, and then the in, in industrialization. Margolin portrays this community already doomed as plagued by the murderous legacy of the a sub, subjugated life just tolerated in a hostile population. He denounces its pa passivity uh, from which Zionism draws one of its major arguments. The genocide is proof of the deceptiveness of assimilation and the insoluble, insoluble contradic contradictions of a life in the diaspora. In a, a journey into the land of Zika, Margolin already saw in, in the passivity of the shtetls towards Soviet power, the beginning of a resignation that would allow their, uh, their annihilation. And now, <clears throat> sitting at a cafe table in Wuj, the traveler um, is trying to re reconstruct the picture of a Jewish life on the eve of the war, contemplating in with, it with uh, other people's eyes, for, exa for example, those of an English tourist. He paints this black picture, I, I quote, deformed bodies, rounded backs, crumpled, sickly, unfresh, wrinkled faces, a shapeless mass, stooped shoulders. Each one squints, turns away or runs without looking. People tired from birth tragic, painful eyes, black frock coats, the uniform of idleness, flat black caps, the sign of the ghetto, uh, 
women without charm, men without pride or quite strength. In eight chapters of childhood, however, Margolin gives a different vision of the shtetl. He now recognized, recognized, recognizes the richness and the uniqueness of this world, so that at times it is adorned with the, the idyllic colors of uh, nostalgia. In the return journey, tending towards Israel, uh, is a farewell, um, if the return journey is a farewell to the geogra to geographical Europe and the in reintegration of a symbolic Europe, the chapters of childhood allow to visit the places of destruction as ancient uh, places of life, cradles of myth mythologies and image that accompany uh, Margolin's intellectual, intellectual and sensitive uh, awakening. The return to childhood, the years uh, 19, um, uh, 1910, uh, also makes it possible to go beyond the vision of a haunted and exhausted Judaism to reveal to reveal a living community evolving, after all, in good understanding with its neighbors. We uh, the wave of pogroms of uh, 1903-1907 is only evoked through the name of uh, Khrushchevan, the person responsible for the pogrom of Kishinev, a name which the adored and lost puppy of little Yuli have inherited. As for the mass deportations of Jews suspected of uh, intelligence with the enemy, enemy during the Great War and the anti-Jewish Jewish violence of the civil war that followed the October Revolution, uh, this uh, anti-chamber of genocide, they remain beyond the um, historical perimeter um, uh, circum circumscribed of, uh, uh, by childhood. Margolin, who in the journey um, claimed the intellectual heritage of the European, European urban, urban world, um, uh, uh, there are two reasons for, for this. He perceives the world of the Gulag as an ASEAN world and Eretz Israel as a Europe, well, outside Europe, a West, outside West. But now he claims to be from that erased universe of the Jewish village of the residence area. He deconstructs, in a sense, his own myth of the West and proposes another, another identity, identity narrative that embraces his his whole, uh, whole life, um, the journey. Uh, this um, outward movement, initially due to the father's, father's frequent changes of workplace, takes on the importance of the universal metaphor in retrospect. Child, childhood is already devo devoted to travel. It is spent in railway stations and in carriages. Uh, I quote, one morning I woke up crying. I woke up crying, go to the station. It was hard to calm me down. It was a real crisis. Everything around me was tormenting me. I was in the grip of nostalgia, not for home, but for wandering. I felt the need for an immediate, in immediate change. Let's go, I implored my mother. I want to take the train, but the time had not yet come. Yet come. Uh, these initial instability experience, experiences, um, experienced by the little boy as a way of uh, knowing the world sheds light on the way in which forced displacement later 
sharpened Margolin's thinking. In the mirror of this story, his entire existence appears as a continuous journey prefig uh, prefigured from childhood through geographical, geographical fascination. At the foundation uh, of Margolin's personality in this story, the word Atlas he received, received as a gift from a Polish priest at the age of seven. A little later, at the turn of the century, which for him was 1910, at the death of Tolstoy, he was totally absorbed in the creation of a, an imaginary country called Nickelonia in the form of maps that he constantly remade. The cartog cartography of memory that is constructed, constructed in the stories of the return is the sketch it, sketch it out through this original gesture by which the child appropriated the world by both by uh, miniature, min, miniaturizing it and by extending extending it to uh, infinity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Jorgensen. And now the second um, presenter today is uh, Professor Marat Greenberg uh, from Reed College. Marat Greenberg uh, emigrated from the former USSR in 1993, studied at the Jewish Theological Seminary and received his PhD from the University of Chicago. He's a scholar of Jewish and Russian literature and culture and of cinema. He is an associate professor of Russian and humanities at Reed College in Portland, Oregon. Greenberg is the author of I'm to be read not from the left to right, but in Jewish from right to left. The Poetics of Boris Nutsky, published in Russian in St. Petersburg, Petersburg in 2021. And another book, Alexandra Skoldov, The Commissar, uh, 2016. His co editor of uh, Woody on Rye, Jewishness in the Films and Plays of Woody Allen. Uh, Marat Greenberg's most recent essays have appeared in tablet magazine, Mosaic, Los Angeles Review of Books, Cineist, and Commentary. He lectures widely on topics ranging from Shoah literature and film to Jewish-Russian poetry. Greenberg's forthcoming book to be published by Brandeis University Press is The Soviet Jewish Bookshelf, Jewish Culture and Identity Between the Lines. Professor Greenberg. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Raman. Uh, wonderful to be here and to, to participate throughout the year in our workshop and, and also in this conference. I have a PowerPoint that I can share. Let's try to see if that will work. Did that, did that work? Yes. Okay. Um, um, my paper is titled Israeli-Soviet Literary Ties from Translations to Bibliotheca Aliyah. The impact of Russian literature on Hebrew and Israeli writing is well known. Many of the major Hebrew poets, such as Leah Goldberg, Avram Shlonsky, and Nathan Alterman, were avid students of Russian verse and transplanted its themes and aesthetics onto the Hebrew ground. Shlonsky and Goldberg were also prolific translators of Russian poetry and prose. The volume of Russian poetry, Shirat Rusya, edited by them, was key in the development of modernist Hebrew poetics. Much less well-known and studied are the post-war Soviet translations of Hebrew-Israeli literature into Russian. Very few of them published during the brief thaw in diplomatic relations between Israel and the USSR in the first half of the 1960s. Six day war in 1967, these Hebrew translations into Russian would be expunged from library circulation and hidden deep within the Jewish readers' private bookcases. They were an integral part of what I call the Soviet Jewish bookshelf, the topic of my forthcoming book. <laughs> 
The Soviet Jewish bookshelf was the basis of Soviet Jews' makeshift Jewish heritage. In an environment where Judaism had been all but destroyed and a public Jewish presence delegitimized, reading uniquely provided for many Soviet Jews an entry to communal memory and identity. The bookshelf was both a depository of selective Jewish knowledge and often the only conspicuously Jewish presence in their homes. I would argue that studying the bookshelf and its Hebrew layer in particular is crucial for grasping the development of Russian literature in Israel. The tastes and proclivities of those who would go on writing and publishing in Russian, as well as translating Hebrew literature after making Aliyah, were shaped by the contents of the Soviet Jewish bookshelf. Russian literature in Israel can hardly be understood without taking its roots into account. This paper will offer an overview and discussion of these translations and how Israeli literature was covered in the ideologically conditioned Soviet environment. The rare translations of contemporary Israeli literature were treasured by Soviet Jewish readers. Those who were able to obtain a copy, the press runs of these editions were on the lower end and did not frequently reach the periphery, seized upon the opportunity to derive whatever information they could about Israel from these slim volumes. Undoubtedly, the most interesting among these books was a collection of Israeli poetry, The Poets of Israel. None other than Boris Slutsky edited it when the Soviet edition appeared in 1963. The idea for the volume was initially conceived by the Israeli poet Alexander Penn, who then put it together and provided most of the initial Russian literal translations. A communist and a student of Russian poets, especially Sergei Isenin, Vladimir Mayakovsky, and Boris Pasternak, Penn came to Palestine from Soviet Russia in the 1920s and became a prominent figure in the Hebrew avant-garde poetry scene. In the 1950s and 60s, the largely leftist but hardly pro-Soviet Israeli literary establishment shunned him because of his communist allegiances. Penn visited the Soviet Union in 1959 at the invitation of the Writers' Union and managed to meet with Boris Pasternak, who was hounded by the regime after the scandal over Dr. Zhivago. Penn knew how to navigate the halls of power. In 1965, his own collection of poems translated from Hebrew, came out from the main Kudorsne Literatura publishing house with a friendly preface by David Samoilov, Slutsky's frenemy. In private, Samoilov, whose own view of anything Jewish was often derisive, complained about needing to work with this low quality poetry. Penn never stopped composing poetry in Russian and always maintained an ambiguous relationship toward both Hebrew and his new homeland, writing of succumbing to the temptation of Hebrew while maintaining his position of an outsider. An introduction to the poets of Israel on behalf of the publishing house, whose specific author was not listed, was most likely Penn's creation. Written in the worst type of official Soviet jargon, it presented the history of Hebrew poetry from a purely class struggle viewpoint, criticizing what it called Jewish poetry for its apolitical nature, and yet praising its humanistic character. The introduction did not voice a criticism of Israel as such, and contained no veiled anti-Semitic overtones. Yet Penn was able to separate between good poetry and the ideologically correct one. Despite the directives of Shmuel Mikunis, head of the Israeli Communist Party, whose rigidity exceeded that of the Soviet censors, Penn managed to include in the collection the best of what Israeli poetry of the time had to offer. The great majority of poets included in the volume were significant in shaping the history of Hebrew and Israeli verse. Only a few of the names, especially the Yiddish and Palestinian Arabic ones, were included largely for political reasons. Penn's volume provided the reader with a concise history of Hebrew poetry after Bialik, the neo-symbolism of Ram Shlonsky, Nathan Alterman, and Leah Goldberg, who visited Moscow in the 1950s, the ruggedness of the poets of the Palmach generation, such as Amir Gilbo and Chaim Guri, high modernists of the late 1950s represented by Yehuda Michai, the early female poets Rachel and Yochevit Bat Miriam, and other important figures. In total, the volume included 40 Hebrew poets. Comparably, the well-known anthology of Israeli poetry published in 1965 in the United States, the modern Hebrew poem itself, had a similar content. The Soviet collection omitted, however, Uri Tzvi Greenberg, whose right-wing allegiances made him a persona non grata. Noticeably short biographies of all the poets were appended at the end of the volume, indicating where they were born, mainly in the Russian Empire, and when they left for Palestine. A great deal of the poems addressed the Holocaust, thus making the collection especially appealing to the Soviet Jewish reader. Some of the volume's translations carried a polemical, a polemical and even subversive meaning. Alterman's most programmatic Zionist poem, The Silver Tray, 
which was included in the collection, ends with the following coda in the English translation. Then the nation rinsed by tears and by magic will ask, who are you? And the two silent till now will speak. Were the silver tray on which the Jewish homeland is handed to you. So they say and collapse at her feet wrapped in shadow and the rest will be told in the books of the Chronicles of Israel. The Russian translation of these lines read, И народ весь в слезах спросит, кто вы, и хором скажут оба пришельцы в крови и пыли. Мы – то блюдо серебряное, на котором государство иудейское вам поднесли. Скажут так и падут, тень на лица их ляжет, остальное истории видно да скажет. By calling the Jewish state Judean, the translation provocatively posits its historic and religious roots. Еврейское, Jewish, would have been fine metrically, and the Hebrew original is Medinata Eudim, state of the Jews. Yet the Russian also conveys tenuousness, inconclusiveness, and open-endedness. Open History, perhaps, will tell, which implicitly responds to the uncertainties of Soviet Jews' present and future, and the fact that they too might be included in that history, as indeed would happen with their immigration to Israel. Originally, Penn was meant to be the sole editor of the anthology, but ultimately the publishing house decided to appoint a Soviet figure as an editor. The choice fell on Boris Slutsky. As the volume's editor, Slutsky was naturally heavily involved in the collection. He took interest in the Israeli poets, while they took an interest in him. Omri Ronan recalls how Leah Goldberg, who visited the USSR as part of the delegation of women affiliated with the left in 1954, and then in the early 60s, asked her host to see Slutsky in Moscow. The request was denied, and she was offered to meet with Samuel Marshak instead. In the eyes of the authorities, the Jews were interchangeable. Slutsky also might have been involved in the publication only a few years later of the only Soviet Hebrew Russian dictionary edited by Felix Shapiro. He recalled Shapiro in his great poem, Relearning Solitude. I remember how I once ran into a compiler of dictionaries of that ancient tongue that was learned and forgotten by me. There is a puzzle in the collection which may hold the key to Slutsky as the reader of Hebrew poetry. One poet in particular seems to be mostly out of place in its pages, Yehuda Michai. On the one hand, by 1963, Amichai was already a well-established and celebrated figure. On the other hand, Penn and Amichai were in very different artistic camps. Amichai's poetry, with its deliberate aversion to politics, minimalist aesthetics, and reliance on German and American modernist rather than Russian poetic models, had very little, if anything, in common with Penn's bombastic Mayakovskian verse. In the collection, Amichai is inconveniently stuck in between the minor poet Hillel and the Palestinian Issa Lubani. Yet he was represented by three poems, two of which God full of mercy, and I want to die in my own bed were some of his most programmatic. Shmuel Mikunis, who objected to the inclusion of Amichai, wrote to Penn that his poetry represented nihilism in the mode of struggles and searches of the petit bourgeoisie. De Arbel is listed as the translator of God full of mercy. There is no evidence at all who he was. Strangely, no other translations of his appear anywhere else. There is a great deal of affinity between Amichai's and Slutsky's minimalist poetry, especially in its take on war, which suggests to me that the poem was in fact translated by Slutsky, who took the pseudonym, who took the pseudonym of Arbel. Furthermore, Slutsky's own poem, My Style of Weaving Words, appears to be a response to Amichai. Amichai's statement from God Full of Mercy, I who use only a small part of the words in the dictionary, was echoed in Slutsky's I am neither enamored with nor bewitched by my style of weaving words. Like a brush to a military nurse's uniform, metaphor is not becoming to my line. The Poets of Israel was received very favorably in Israel. It was discussed in the Israeli press as the harbinger of new relations between Israel and the USSR. A collection of Bialik's poetry and Vladimir Jabotinsky's turn of the century translations was in the works, but everything of course fell apart after 1967. In Moscow, the reaction was also positive. Sovietish Heimland ran an approving review of it. More importantly, Sergei Naravchatov, a poet from Slutsky's cohort, who was often asked with writing on Jewish, who was often tasked with writing on Jewish poetry, praised the collection with an almost Zionist pathos in Novy Mir, quotation, the ancient biblical land, the dry wind of the rocky deserts, fierce azure of the inflamed sky, the dried up beds of rivers, but this is only where there is no moisture. Where there does exist its nourishing force, there rustle the olive trees, the mighty grape vines grow, the freshly plowed fields darken. This land has its poetry and its poets. In addition to the poets of Israel, there were also a few anthologies of Israeli prose, most notably The Searches of Pearls, novellas of Israeli writers published in 1966, and Stories of Israeli Writers, which appeared a year earlier. 
Their coverage of Israeli prose was also considerably broad and included such luminaries as Chaim Azaz and Moshe Shamir, Shmuel Yosef Agnon, and the young Aaron, Aaron Abelfeld. Both volumes contain prefaces with overviews of the history of Hebrew literature. Some of their claims, undoubtedly perceived originally as ideological biases, appear in hindsight accurate. R. Ilyin pointed out in his preface to The Searcher of Pearls, quotation, contemporary Israel is the main theme of the works of great many writers who grew up in the country. Israeli critics call them the literature of anxiety and doubts. The main late motif of this literature is the split between Zionist ideals and reality on the ground. This indeed was one of the main thrusts of Israeli literature. Ilyin also pointed out what could not have escaped the reader's attention. The Second World War, which was accompanied by the unprecedented racial hatred, factories of death and ghettos filled with millions of people, caused the emergence in Israel of the literature of catastrophe and heroism. And if in the initial stages, the notes of utter despair and pessimism prevailed in it, in the last years, more and more attention is given to the theme of heroism of ghetto fighters and the selfless struggle of the Jewish partisans." End of quotation. Aaron Virgelis wrote a lengthy preface to the stories of Israeli writers, Israeli literature and its roots. Virgelis, chief editor of the Yiddish periodical Sovietish Hameland, which began its run in 1961, and a poet and prose writer in his own right, was both an entrenched insider within the Soviet system, system and a clever outsider. While Sovietish Hameland was often at the vanguard of anti-Israeli fervor, Virgelis appreciated and respected Hebrew literature. His preface was a learned and comprehensive piece, devoid of overt propaganda, but following the main guidelines of Marxist view of the development of literary processes. Virgelis reached back to biblical antiquity and the medieval Spanish period, which he called archipelago on the bottom of the ocean, and put the trajectories of Hebrew and Yiddish literature side by side. In his own travel to the West, 16 countries, including Monaco, Virgelis described his meeting with Shmuel Yosef Agnon in London after the Hebrew writer whom he admired received his Nobel Prize in Literature. It was originally published in Literaturnea Gazeta. Despite the usual criticism of Israel, which the reader could easily plow through, the Soviet editions did not question the legitimacy of Israel as a Jewish state or its literature as an indelible part of millennial Jewish textual tradition. It is also significant that they almost universally used the term Ivrit for Hebrew rather than Drevni Ivrieski, ancient Jewish, which emphasized the immediacy and relevancy of the Jewish state. These volumes supplanted the materials brought or smuggled by Israeli emissaries for the Soviet Jews, though hardly anyone outside of Moscow could have access to them. Much to the enthusiasm of Moscow Jews prior to 1967, Israel took part in the international book fairs and youth festivals. Israeli films were occasionally screened at the International Moscow Film Festival, most notably in 1964, when the French-Israeli film about the Eichmann trial, The Glass Cage, was included in the festival's main program. Even the most tendentious of the pre-1967 Soviet reflections on Israeli society and culture managed to inform the reader. In 1955, Grigory Plotkin, a Ukrainian Jewish writer with impeccable ideological credentials, he would go on to co-author a preface to the notorious pamphlet Judaism Unadorned, published a book in both Ukrainian and Russian, Journey to Israel, technically the first Soviet guidebook to the Jewish state. Describing Israel as an impoverished lackey of the United States and its Zionist ideology as incurably reactionary, it also contained a cautiously perceptive analysis of the major Hebrew writers. Plotkin called Shmuel Yosef Agnon, mistakenly named here Leib, the oldest Israeli prose writer whose works are filled with marvelous religious prejudices, and even identified Uri Tzvi Greenberg as talented prior to his joining the right-wing obscur uh, obscurantists. Evaluations of Greenberg by the main Israeli poetic scene were not that different. Plotkin praised Moshe Shamir's novel about the Maccabees and naturally celebrated Penn. He was favorable toward Nathan Alterman and especially Avram Shlonsky for his masterful translations of Eugene Onegin and Sholokhov's and Quiet Flows the Dawn. Later, Shlonsky would also translate Babel. Despite the necessary ideological obtuseness and, and tendentiousness, Plotkin was perceptive and inadvertently looking ahead. In 1965, Abilov, uh, the pseudonym of Ellenson, one of the few Soviet translations and scholars of Hebrew literature, whose translations were included in the prose collections I discussed above, published a lengthy essay on Shlonsky's translation of Eugene Onegin in the prestigious Mastery of Translation Almanac, edited by Karnei Chukovsky. 
Containing numerous quotations from Shlonsky's Hebrew, transliterated in Cyrillic, Belov's piece revealed how the Israeli poet not merely translated, but Judaized Pushkin through the virtuoso employment of traditional imagery of the ancient book, Psalm, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Proverbs, to recreate Pushkin's images, thoughts, moods far removed from the Bible. End of quotation. For the Jewish reader immersed in this highly valued publication, it undoubtedly felt remarkable to see the beloved Pushkin's lines speak Hebrew. Shlonsky was deeply flattered with Belov's piece and engaged in a rich long correspondence with him, also supplying him with materials from Israel. In addition to this correspondence, part of Shlonsky's fascination with Soviet Jewry was the collection he edited in 1962, My Spring Will Come, Poems of a Soviet Jew, by an anonymous author in the original Russian and Hebrew translations. The anonymous author was E. Damalsky, the pseudonym of Mikhail Baitalsky, who spent years in the Gulag and was unable to make Aliyah. Belov did immigrate to Israel in the 1970s, where he continued to be a prolific translator and edited a notable volume, I Told Myself to the End, Verse of Israeli Female Poets. This collection was published by Biblioteca Aliyah, the press which played a large role in Soviet Jewish history. Biblioteca Aliyah was both an enlightening and ideological Zionist enterprise. It was started in 1972 by the Society for the Study of Jewish Communities, part of Nativ, Ishkada Kesher, the governmental agency responsible for supplying Soviet Jews with materials from Israel and encouraging Aliyah. The books of Biblioteca Aliyah were deliberately small so that they could be easily hidden in one's pocket. In the 70s and early 80s, they formed the core of Soviet Jewish intellectual universe, at least in the larger cities such as Moscow and Leningrad and in the Baltic republics. Those outside of the capitals of Riga would not have access to these volumes until Perestroika. A major refusenik writer, David Schreier Petrov, encapsulated the significance of these books for the Jewish reading public, mainly many of whom desired immigration, in his novel, Cursed Be You, Just Don't Die, quotation. And now who do we read? Zinger, Jabotinsky, Bialik, David Markish, Malamud, Leon Uris, Nathan Alterman, Nigal Alon, and many others published by Biblioteca Aliyah, end of quotation. I conclude with the following thought. To a large extent, Biblioteca Aliyah was not a break with the Soviet editions of Israeli literature, but perhaps paradoxically an expansion and continuation of them. True, the ideological framework completely changed, but the idea that literature cannot be divorced from ideology remained, making literary texts an indelible part of readers' identity, be they in Moscow, Kiev, or Tel Aviv. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marat. <clears throat> was great and now our third presenter Dr. Marina Aptiakman. Marina are you here? Yeah <laughs> all right. Um, Marina Aptiakman graduated from Hebrew University of Jerusalem in 1997 and in 2006 received her PhD degree in Slavic languages and literatures from Brown University. She is currently a lecturer in Russian and Jewish studies and the coordinator of Russian language program at Tufts University in Boston, Massachusetts. Her book, Jacob's Letter, Kabbalistic Allegory in Russian Literature, was published by Academic Studies Press in 2011. She is the author of numerous articles on Russian literature and culture, Russian Jewish and Soviet Jewish literature, and literature of Russian-born immigrant authors in the USA and Israel. She lives with her family in Boston, Massachusetts. Marina? Yes, thank you everyone for having me here. And it's, you know, kind of challenge to speak after such interesting um, uh, papers. Marat, thank you. The paper was fascinating. I heard some parts of it when you came to lecture at Tufts, but this is much more broad and it's really, really interesting. Um, I have a question, actually. I'm a little bit confused, Raman. I have a question to you. Do I have 20 minutes or half an hour? I don't want to go over the limit because I know that I do it sometimes. So I want to know what is my limit. I have 20 minutes. 20 minutes. Okay, great. That's yeah. what I was thinking of. Okay, wonderful. So I want to share. I can share the screen. Yes, yes, I can. I can share the screen. And what I am going to talk about is um it's interesting that and i'm sorry that i missed i had to miss the the, the first um panel and i didn't hear um dennis professor sobolev's presentation on literature of the poetry of 1990s 
Um, so if by any chance I'm repeating something that you already heard or it contradicts something that you already heard, I would be glad, you know, if in the comments we'll bring it up because I want to see, you know, what, what am I talking about and what Dennis was talking about. Is it like together or is it contradicting? However, I will be speaking quite briefly about some very short period and actually about one particular figure um, about Michael Gendrick. And um, it's interesting that, that really when we speak about Russian-Israeli literature, more and more we speak about either, you know, 70s um, or 90s and already 2000s. But for some reason, this watershed, you know, this moment when the big Aliyah came and things actually have, have changed for some completely, um, somehow didn't come up a lot in, in, in what I heard. So I want really to concentrate on that period and not so much in that period, but particularly on the figure of Michael Gendelev and his role um, in Russian literature before and after this watershed. Uh, since this presentation is in English, I wouldn't analyze the poems a lot because I was thinking that I'm definitely not a professional enough to translate the poets in the presentation when I write hopefully the, the chapter for, for a month's book, I will definitely do it. But I don't think that I am right now in the position that I can translate the poems in such a way that we can deeply analyze them, although I tried with some. So what I want to start, I want to give like brief introduction, which very much repeats um, things that have already have been said. And somebody actually brought this topic already Then I was at the conference. Then people said, um, what about other literatures which are similar to, 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 to Russian Israeli literature? And the question is that in the fourth year will past actually, a number of great literature have spawned a kind of like some kind of cultural and linguistical enclaves that exist in a somewhat different way from the metropolis. For example, the English language literature of India or the French language literature of Tunisia or Algeria or Quebec, or even for example, Latin American literatures, you know, which are in no way reducible to the heritage of Spain or Portugal in, in Americas, but uh, something completely new, but still reflect on their heritage place. Um, in my opinion, are examples of such literature. Um, uh, therefore, for example, an Algerian poet uh, can participate in the literary process of France, but at the same time, identify himself not with French, but with Algerian literature. And at the same time, of course, the difference from the writers of the metropolis will be reduced um, not so much to the place of residence, but to language variation, the use of local realities, and so on. In the terminology of um, Denise Druzhenian, um, uh, this phenomenon very much is designated, are designated as special, like, linter, special interliterary communities. And we can say from this conference from the uh, working group, the round table that I have been taking already for a year with Raman and, and, and my colleagues, um, we can definitely say of the existence at least one such phenomenon that can be regarded as probably, you know, proto-enclave or maybe already kind of well-developed enclave of such literature. Um, the literary speaking literary enclave in, in Israel, 100%. And um, these processes, however, that led to this like proto enclave already, you know, well-created enclave, um, definitely happened later than early 1990s. But in this presentation, I want to speak about the person who by many can be regarded probably the most famous um, Russian literary figure, the most famous literary figure of Russian Israeli literary scene of late 1980s and early 1990s. And also whose fate, in my view, is as complicated as it's tragic. And that's Michael Gendry. Brief biography that probably many of the people, you know, in this conference already know. Uh, Michael Gendelev was born in Leningrad in 1950, and he died in 19, uh, 2009. And uh, he graduated from the Leningrad Medical Institute. He worked as a sport physician. And when he was still young, he largely participated in the Leningrad underground poetic circles of early and middle 1970s. Uh, in um, 1977, he emigrated, and you know what, let me just to do it larger, just give me one second, I want to do slideshow, because if I do slideshow, it will be larger. 
Yeah, and um, he, great, he immigrated in Israel in 1977. From 1979, he lived in Jerusalem. And what is very important, he uh, participated in the Lebanon War of 1982 as a combat paramedic. And he also was the post president of the Jerusalem Literary Club when it was created. What is, however, like the most important is that we need to speak about um, the ideology, the literary ideology of 1970s and 1980s in Israel, because it's very much different uh, from those um, Russian Jewish authors who at the same time emigrated to the United States and um, lived and wrote in America. And I think there is some kind of like sad irony in it. Because those who lived in Israel very much stressed their ideological and I would say spiritual connection to the country they lived in. Making Aliyah wasn't for many people of that generation still is, we had actually a conversation of that in our meetings at the round table, was different from immigration. It had a much deeper meaning. Uh, the people who lived in Israel in the 1980s wanted to stress that they're Israeli writers whose goal is eventually to leave Russian language whatsoever forever. Writing in Russian, they regarded it just as a transitional period. And in 1980s, a poet who wrote in Russian, living in Israel, feeling himself, you know, a citizen of this young, not yet fully formed country, did not recognize himself as an immigrant. Very much unlike um, his like fellow and compatriot in language, uh, who at the same time, you know, lived in Paris, New York, or San Francisco. And uh, the whole idea was that the Israeli poet who writes Russian didn't lose anything with his departure, you know, really doesn't have some kind of nostalgia. But on the contrary, seems to acquire his like homeland by blood, but also didn't lose his former homeland by language. He would be offended if you call him an immigrant because he is, yes, no, no, you know, returning to his historical soul. But also he will be offended if you reproach him for being cut from his Russian linguistical soil. And um, it's interesting that at the same time, you know, when I looked at the newspapers of that time and the magazines of that time, uh, Russian Israeli intellectuals, especially in late 80s, uh, when Perestroika started, constantly commented of the like disintegration, the adoration of Russian literature in Metropolia that is in Russia and their constant desire to distance themselves from them. And I want to give um, a quotation um, that's interesting. That's the quotation uh, written by Dmitry Segal in actually 1987. In Russia, there is an atmosphere of such black despair, such spiritual emptiness, such internal simplification and primitivism and most importantly, such reckless disgust for its people and disregard for its needs that it becomes even uncomfortable. I want tyranny to collapse, but it doesn't all bring joy to see the former homeland in humiliation and poverty. Agree, it's pretty hard to see the place where you have been born so miserable. At the same time, we're talking perhaps not so much about local political disputes, but about, not, about local, national, or international problems to which we in Israel should have our own independent attitude based only on our known national state interests. That, and also, you know, he says that suddenly all of today's Russian culture and literature suddenly lost their inner dignity, their inner right to exist. By contrast, we do have it here on our own spiritually driven soul. And why I decided to quote it, this article that actually what um, Sigal concludes with, he says, against the background of all this, I felt even more strongly the significance of the poetry that fate faced me in the form of poems, one poem by Michael Gendelev on the first holiday then when, published in the last spring issue of the magazine 22. Of course, in order to experience all the happiness of life in Israel, poetry is not needed. But for me, the appearance of this poem became some kind of wonderful first metaphysical proof of the correctness of our life here. Gendelip's poem returned to me the feeling that art, great art, can and does live not only in our days, not only next to us, but it can also fully represent us. Reading Gendelip's poems, I realized that the last trace of the feeling that maybe we lost something important by leaving Russian language left me forever. I mean, like living in Russia, sorry, left me forever. In the previous article, I advocated for Hebraization of communication of the Russian community. 
Gendry's poems are wonderful proof that this process is possible, moreover leads to remarkable results. These verses could be written only by a person who deeply knew the essence of Hebrew and Hebrew poetry, but they were written by a man who knows about the world and about something more from the position of some ideal Russian poet whose chance of survival in Russia are now equal to zero. And this is the end of the quote. All this is quote from Sigal. So what really Sigal says that number one, the eventual goal is to leave uh, Russian for Hebrew and that writing in Russian is a transitional period. And also very much, even when he says about a poet writing in Russian language, he says that that's the Israeli poet, that it's a poet who takes Russian language and applies it to the rules of Hebrew syntax, to Hebrew uh, form of the poem, to Hebrew poetic structure, this all old Hebraization. And that's indeed very much what, uh, if you look at uh, Michael Gendelik's poem of, of 1980s, uh, what he tried to do. What is interesting, however, he never wrote in Hebrew. And actually, in spite of indeed serving in the army, uh, Gendelik's Hebrew was quite rudimentary. However, he very much stressed that his Israeli poetry, his Russian language Israeli poetry, was influenced by Guda Amichai and Chaim Guri, and he translated Guri and Amichai into Russian. His poetic structure, and we'll look at some poems in Russian for people who doesn't speak Russian in this audience. I just want us to analyze together the structure to see what's going on. His poetic structure really tried to break as much as possible with the Russian tradition. And he himself repeated in 1980s that in order to become a true poet, I want to fully forget Russian language. And in order to create this kind of Israeli style of Russian poetry, um, Gendarev creates the so-called butterfly structure. Uh, a lot of critics says that virtually really this text imitated the Hebrew poetry um, and imitated actually the structure of Hebrew letters on the piece of paper. And one of the reviews at that time pointed out Gendelev's position um, in culture is borderline. He himself very much is a border guard of his native language who seems to find himself in a kind of linguistic vigilance put forward in front of the main forces of the outpost. He really tries, you know, some kind, you know, to bring this romantic perception of the new reality after accepting the citizenship of the country, basically waging the unsense in, like, in not ending war for existence. And the graphing uh, structure has changed. And we can look at it just for a moment. You know, I wouldn't quote what I want to show, especially for people don't speak Russian, really that what he tries to do, he tries to create uh, this like butterfly you know, structure. And also, although syntax is still very much in a way linear, he tries to disjoin sentences. He tries to put parts of the sentences. He tries to use um, uh, like kind of very much disjoint emotional syntax. And what is also interesting that um, he himself studied Arabic poetry. And although most of the critic, uh, say, oh, definitely Arabic poetry, Russian translation, it says that the uh, the structure follows Hebrew poetry of Amichai and of Guri, uh, you can also very much see somehow the influence of the Arabic poetry as well. And I think this is important because although a lot of critics really say, you know, how Gendrick's poetry is Israeli, I would like to argue a little bit because to my opinion, it's much more, I would say, colonial British Palestinian. He views the country very much, not as like Jewish immigrant outsider, but in the tradition of those Russian visitors to the land of Palestine who came in 1920s and 1930s. He has a lot, a lot of these colonial details, you know, to make this space around him extremely exotic, extremely Middle Eastern. And quite a few critics compared his approach to war, for example, as an approach of Rayard Kipling. And that's interesting because um, Gendelev's generation adored definitely Kipling. And indeed, when you read um, Gendelev's texts, you see this some kind of similar beauty of a person who comes from boring, I would say, European country 
into wild, bright, smelly, colorful uh, world of Orient, you know? And in this sense, it's actually very, very romantic. And also interesting that he shares this colonial opinion, colonial approach, also very much when he speaks about the war. When he talks about the war in Lebanon, he constantly speaks about the beauty of violence and also the beauty of death on battlefield. And as a result, his poetry actually can be regarded by some as militaristic. And Gendelev's for when he describes his experience in Lebanon, is completely free from all tragedy. It becomes like a ritual, you know, some kind of fun-based evil game. And it's interesting that by contrast, most Russian authors, most Russian intellectuals actually never shared such attitude. War that Gendelev praised has been always despised by Israelis, death by many, you know, by many Israelis who have been living through it for decades never was as poeticized, you know, in Hebrew poetic narrative. And that actually probably started to create clashes between Gendelev and the Israeli poets already in 1980s. And these clashes only intensified later. You know, the militant, I would even say radical, some kind of, you know, right-wing Zionism of Russian Jews clashed with like leftist in the quotations, peacery and the views of cultural and Hebrew cultural elite and actually very much probably got on the way of the recognitions um, of Russians uh, by the cultural, you know, establishments. And it's interesting that while Russians at that time uh, kept saying that they are Israelis, actually Hebrew speaking Israeli elite kept considering them Russians and actually opposed their incorporation to the society. And I want to give just one example that I translated because I think that's probably like one of the strongest examples that, you know, a Syrian inside is red, dark and wet. His giblets are blue, visible, his bone is white. He was alive until our troops took tear and the Syrians became dead, inshallah. So Gendelev, um, far late, definitely, you know, to summarize what I just said, he led the foundation for that, you know, so-called avant-garde Russian-Israeli poetry, there are also some critics called neo-baroque poetry, that united the school of the Lenin and the ground, Israeli realities and linguistic structure and the Russian language. And in this sense, he created a unique phenomenon because it's not immigrant poetry, it's not poetry of the ghetto, but definitely Israeli poetry. Yet also at the same time, the poetry that lives under the one side influence of the Hebrew text, but is completely out of the contact with the representative of this environment, you know, on the other side. If Gendelev's own texts were indeed probably written under the influence of Chaim Guri and Amichai, the text of the author of the authors of the Gendelev circle, you know, about which I'm going to talk in a few minutes, while already written exclusively under the influence of his own texts and had no direct connection with the Israeli poetry whatsoever. So, uh, basically, um, it's... Uh, so here comes the saddest part of the irony that I just introduced. The Russian authors who left the USSR at the same time as Gendelev but resided in the US adopted the completely opposite ideology. They constantly stressed in their work the feeling of alienation, not feeling the Americans, always being outsiders, immigrants. However, from the point of view of like everyday life, they actually were much more adapted into the literary and cultural reality around them than most Israeli Russian authors. They secured the place and could live off their writing due to grants and also because of their academic teaching that allowed them summer vacations and sabbatical. They became the part of the establishment as much as they kept saying that they are not the part of. Their works were translated into English. They were read in literary courses, probably because of the Cold War. Michael Dendelev never achieved such state, state of affairs. He was never be able to secure a literary job. He tried to earn his living as a medical professional, but also could never become a doctor. He constantly suffered from the lack of money and also very close, you know, took um, the, to the heart his lack of recognition. And it's interesting that in the late 1980s, he often showed his true dislike of Joseph Brodsky, whom he regarded as his rival, because indeed Gendelev was basically the most famous Russian-Israeli poet, while Brodsky was most famous American Russian poet. And Brodsky did actually the same thing that Gendelev did. He tried to create a new type of Russian 
poetry which would imitate American poetry in the structure, in the syntax, in the stanza. But, you know, Brodsky got Nobel Prize and Brodsky became extremely famous also in Russia in 1990s, early 1990s. Everything that Gendelev um, was not able to achieve. But in 1990, the big came. Gendelik never got well with more traditional poets who at the same time lived in the same city. For example, Rita Levinson and Alexander Vlavik. But in the 1990s, with the start of Big Galia, young poets started to arrive to Israel. Many of them settled in Jerusalem because it was considered the spiritual capital. And some of them formed an unofficial literary circle that actually Gendelik largely influenced and guided. And besides young poets, it also started to attract young journalists and critics, and also Israeli-Russian poets and writers who already belong to Gendelev friends, such as Vladimir Tarasov, Sergei Shergarovsky. A small apartment on the last floor of the British colonial building of Bigoda Street became a cultural hub for this group. The circle included Demyan Kudryavtsev, Anna Karpa, who wrote under the pen name of Anna Garenka, Anton Karif, Anton Nosik, and so on. In 1991, at a small cafe on Mahane Buda, which was called Nisim, a small diner, basically this place became some kind of, you know, new rotunda or cafe atara uh, for this like new generation of this young and pretty poor intellectuals uh, surrounded by, uh, who, who were influenced by Gendelik. And the group also produced a few pretty short leaf literary magazines, such as Inhabited Islands. From uh, all poets of Gendelik's you know, circle, probably two most interesting are Anna Karp and Demyan Kudryavtsev. I wouldn't concentrate on that because already probably Denis spoke about the poetry of the 90s. Uh, what I already just want to say, and this is like really interesting because um, a lot of critics say that uh, Anna Garenko also constantly called herself an Israeli poet. But by contrast with Gendelev, who does have a lot of um, true, I would say, I wouldn't call it Israeli, but like Palestinian details, you know, uh, it's, it's, it definitely is Israeli poetry. When we look at the poetry of Anna Garenko and even Demyan Kudryavtsev, really the, the number of Israeli realities are extremely, extremely small. It's probably just some like geographical uh, geographical names, and that's mostly it. It could be pretty much written in Russia or anywhere. But what is also important that if you look at the structure of these poems, for example, if you look, you know, in the same butterfly structure, it really very much written under Gendelev's poetry. Uh, and it's even stronger than that because Gendelev rewrote poems of, of his disciples. He basically, you, you brought him a draft and he completely rewrote this draft fully according to his own standards. And that actually, you know, had some negative, um, uh, negative feedback on it because a lot of poets uh, who at the beginning were very much connected with Gendelev started to leave one by one. Alexander Barash actually was one of them who decided, and there will be a presentation on Barash later, he decided, you know, to do his own like Mediterranean circle. And as most people here probably know, Anna Garenko started to be connected with youth subculture of 1990s, early 1990s in Jerusalem, which very much used drugs and died from drug overdose at the age of, of 27. And I think that one of the reasons why they happened, it's probably because really what, what, what Gendelev did in a way was negative because he took people's personality out of them when it you know, came to literature. So in 1990s, um, major Russian immigrant authors from US gained very large. So one minute. Yeah, but Gendelev never did. And in 1991, a book by two American Russians, you know, Peter Weil and Alexander Guinness, uh, started to become a hit in Russia. And Gendelev started to move away and away from poetry. He started to write more in newspapers that started to originate at the time, premium perfectly, you know, in later Vesti. And he wrote a book, the book of tasty and all healthy food or the food of Russians in Israel, that indeed very much tried to imitate what uh, Violin Guinness did, but never achieved the same popularity. So um, uh, in late 1990s, uh, Gendelev starts less and less write poetry. He 
is more and more connected with one of his disciples, Diplan Kudryavtsev, who now lives in Moscow, and he moves to Moscow, lives under the financial support of Indermen Kubryanzov and Boris Kitizovsky, and more and more uh, participates in, in, in journalism and politics, and actually dies, although in Israel, but he comes to Israel just because he needs medical attention. He lives his last years in Russia, and he's probably much more now has a legacy among people in Russia and expatriates rather than in Israel. To finish, Gendalif is called by many a national poet of Israel, yet he probably exemplified the saddest irony of the meaning of the term. The poet who constantly was constructed his new identity, who once said, мне так хотелось бы уйти из нашей русской речи, уйти мучительно и не по -человечи. I so much want to leave our Russian speech. I want to leave it so unhumanly and through such suffering, who have been ripping himself apart, trying to separate from his own Russian voice, ended up going back to Russia. In the legacy of Michael Dendelev as the first Russian Israeli poet, and his small and brief but important circle that ignited the short yet extremely vibrant Russian Israeli cultural life in Jerusalem in the early 1990s, is certainly, in my opinion, one of the most important legacies in the history of Russian literary Israel. And if um uh, and if Roma gives me two minutes, I want to read a poem that I wrote in 1990, which I want to read because I want to you know, people don't know it, and they want, I, it, it's devoted to the memory of, of, of Anna Garenka, and was written in 1998, and it was my friend, but to all the people who belong to Gendelev Circle and who's already dead. Прозрачности белого света, потерянной богом души, все вымыслы, все обеты, все домыслы хороши. В песчаной и каменной этой стране, где себя не тая, так яркие и четкие приметы бездонного бытия где цветом становится запах и в звук превращается цвет, где в рыжих рассыпчатых лапах мой город, как божий макет. Я в гости приеду на месяц, и мы еще посидим под жатко нагретым навесом, вливая в себя кофеин с корицей и кардамоном на пластиковой скамье под взглядом намеренно сонным араба в длинной куфе. На рыночной улочке длинной, зажатой меж пористых стен Сушедшую, как в пустыню, в пустоту, в двадцать семь, тобой, на базарной плеше, встреченной невзначай, как прежде ругаясь, как прежде, опять друг на друга крича, тобой с макуля в каждом глотке аромат тепла. И это совсем не важно, что ты уже умерла. That's it. Thank you for listening to it. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, very touching presentation. And now we'd like to open the discussion of uh, three presentations of uh, Luba Jorgensen, Marat Greenberg, and Marina Ptiekman. Um, so, if you want to ask something, just raise your hand or yeah, push the button, raise hand, or make any other sign me Denise yes just open your mic yeah sure uh, uh, it's more common than a question uh, and uh, first many thanks to Marina for for the presentation uh, and it, uh, she at the beginning, she told probably that it is overlapping what was I was saying or was going to say no. And furthermore, it seems to me it's uh, 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 Marina's presentation is exemplifying what I was trying to say about the generation preceding the poetry uh, of 1990s uh, in two different important senses. Uh, first, identity based. And uh, as far as I understand it, as far as I remember, as far as I know, Gendel's poetry is very much identity based. And second, what I said about the double confrontation, which was ironic, first confrontation uh, towards uh, mm -hmm. Russia and even the Russian language, uh, and second, toward the Israeli context. And uh, 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 I just didn't have enough time to. Uh, 
uh, to talk more about this, but it seems to me that uh, Marina the, did this in an extremely impressive and in extremely detailed way, and I'm really grateful for it because uh, uh, she brought very specific example of this ironic double confrontation, which was slowly disappearing at the beginning of the 1990s, and uh, uh, by the end of, of the 1990s was basically gone uh, almost completely in the in the Israeli-Russian poetry. And uh, it seems to me this is also a part of this ontological uh, turn when the the common basis of ontology replaces the the uh, the identity based, based discourse, identity oriented discourse, and different uh, uh, di different ideological tensions. Uh, and, and so, this is uh, uh, an example of, from, of this starting point of the process I was trying to, to at least to briefly exp uh, explicate. Uh, so, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, thank you. Thank you, Denise. Thank you. Thank you. More questions? Yes. I was pretty much afraid. Yes, if I may. <laughs> yes. Um, first of all, I would like to thank everybody in such, for such an interesting session. Uh, but I especially, of course, want to thank um, Professor Jorgensen for doing all the work on restoring Margolin's complete text, which I happen to have translated into English um, based on the full Russian text. And I just wanted to add rather a comment um, in terms of Margolin's journey. Uh, what I found especially touching um, in the last section, the journey to the West, it, it's not only the geographical um, move back, but it's so much, uh, he always manages to both uh, combine a personal um, development with a more universal meaning. And in this case, after the camp, um, his first return is a physical one. When he's in, I mean, it's, it's <laughs> you have to admit it, he admits it, that his first return to life is seeing these women uh, it's, it's a physical return after being uh, a nobody <laughs> um, and that he can feel uh, love, sensual love for a person. Um, and that's a part of his stage uh, of his return back to his own family in Israel. And the other part of his journey is very much an intellectual one after his a stay in the camp where in the camp, as he is kind of in the last stages of barely surviving, he tries to keep his mind alive by trying to recall classical uh, texts. One of them he can't re remember is the uh, citation from Horace, um, which means I, I, I shall not wholly die, um, the, the ode starts. And as he returns again, to Israel, uh, his path leads him through Paris where his brother-in-law gives him a copy of Sartre's um, Being and Nothingness. Uh, and um, he, he reads this and it's his return to intellectual life, um, recalling his own past as a doctor in uh, philosophy. Um, but at the same time, his return to intellectual life in the West, uh, he also realizes that he has been very much changed by his stay in camp. And he, he finds the whole idea that life is nothing and has no meaning very repulsive after his own camp experience. And, and uh, his return to Israel, where he finds also that people don't understand uh, both what he went through and his feelings about the Soviet Union, he's disappointed. But it's part, again, of a return to a full intellectual life, which nevertheless he, he continues as he, as he writes in Israel for uh, Russian language and Hebrew language things. And I, th I think that's a very important part of uh, Mark Golan's journey. <laughs>
back to life. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, of course, thank you Phil, for this comment. Uh, in fact, uh, I presented uh, just a little part, a little piece of a bigger uh, uh, study, and I hope to develop it uh, in, uh, in our project. Uh, and uh, you are perfectly right uh, to, um, to uh, mention this uh, part of uh, return to uh, uh, both uh, the body uh, life and the intellectual life and the, um, this episode with um, uh, the Horace a poem is very important, and I, I, I wrote a big uh, comment to this uh, episode. Um, I think I hope to to uh, to offer it uh, in this um, common uh, study uh, because it um, uh, it is a, a, a an intellectual construction. Uh, uh, which we find sometimes uh, in uh, the uh, testimony texts, um, the the scene of the remembration of the of the of the, um, mem is the, the, the memory scene. Uh, for example, uh, in uh, Primo Levi's uh, uh, Sequestri un uomo. Um, we had this uh, chapter uh, on the uh, song of uh, Ulysses, um, where Levi tried to remember uh, uh, Dante's uh, um, poems. Yeah. And uh, Margolin, uh, uh, who, who, who did not uh, know Levi, of course, in this uh, uh, time, um, um, but he 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 um, he writes some some uh, kind of uh, um, of uh, similar um, um, construction of uh, of memory without um, within within uh, his. Uh, um his testimony well this is a, a very a very uh, uh, big um, uh, topic thank you thank you <laughs> all right more questions <coughs> uh, Leonid, please and then alexi maybe let's return our previous session. Uh, and now I, I want to speak about the quotation that Masha gave us from Dmitry Segal. It is a very, very interesting parallel to today's for discussions about Putin's situation. Have hope or not, hopeless Russia or it's, it's possible to live in Russia and so on. So we have maybe such historical uh, process, our hopes under Stalin, after Stalin, then after Khrushchev, then near, for example, Olympic games, then Destroika, and now in Putin's epoch. So it may be this quotation uh, may become a base for our discussion. That's my first point. Uh, and the second is that let's uh, look at uh, Handelev's fate in general. You know that uh, Berezovsky helped him not ac accidentally because he was a member of his command, political command, and I with Demokudrevsky uh, quite seriously uh, to take part in political life in Russia. And I'm not sure that he was a serious politician, but he was a member of that circle at first. And then it seems to me that when we compare Gendelev and Brodsky, we must take into account uh, the very contradictive position 
against Brodsky by Mikhail Gendelev. All his poetry after the death of Brodsky is a reaction of, Brod of Brodsky's position when he was afraid of Muslims during the Afghanistan war. And Gendelev asked all his uh, from Muslim text in his late poetry. I wrote about it, but I didn't publish it. You can find this text on Gendelev's site, personal site. Maybe it is necessary to publish it officially, but it was my special lecture. Thank you. It was impressive. Thank you. Thank you. That's all. All right. Um, Alexei Surin. Yes. Thank you so much. First of all, thank you for the presentation, Marina. It was uh, very exciting. So I, I have a question for, for you, Dr. Abtekman. Uh, for me, it's uh, very interesting and important to understand uh, this case. Uh, you said what uh, Michael Gendelev uh, created or imagined himself as an Israeli poet. poet. So um, he uh, he understand uh, and and he perceived this position for himself precisely as a unique mission to be an Israeli poet, uh, right? Uh, this is my question. It, it yes. was his mission. Yes, mm -hmm. and you know, and actually the, the sad irony of it, and I think for some reason I forgot to mention it in the presentation. Uh, he never was translated into Hebrew till like 2000. And when he was translated, it finally were some Russian friends who arranged these translations and published it. And basically these books even translated into Hebrew went completely unnoticed because it was already, you know, 2000. Uh, but yes, that was, and probably, you know, Professor Katsis can talk more about it than, than I, because he lived during this time in Israel as well. I believe that that was very much um, kind of ideological position that we are, um, and this, this is what is interesting, and, you know, let Raman stop me, because this is something I can talk for, for, for hours, I will be brief. I believe that there is very large difference between Russian-Israeli literature then and Russian-Israeli literature now. Russian-Israeli literature now calls itself Israeli literature very much, and by social status, by social belonging, I would say, uh, no Russian poet or writer in Israel who call themselves Russian from the point of country, you know, as a citizen, even Dina Rubina, you know, I am Israeli. But the language is Russian and there is no desire to start writing in Hebrew, absolutely not. But the literature of the 1980s was completely different. You know, these people wrote in Russian, these people actually, and in the case of Gendelev, he knew Hebrew, pretty rudimentary, very badly. But he constantly said that he is all the time translating Chaim Guri, he translating Yehuda Mikhai, Chaim Guri somehow read his poetry and God knows how because it's in Russian and got like extremely, you know, high, high feedback from Chaim Guri. And the writing in Russian is just transitionary period that there would be a moment that we would stop writing in Russian and we will become fully Hebrew. But this moment unfortunately never arrived because the knowledge of Hebrew of these people was extremely, extremely small. The contact with true Hebrew intellectuals was extremely limited. There was no place for Michael Gendelev in academia, in Israeli journals, nowhere. And the audience was extremely small because it was the audience of the same Russian speaking intellectuals, but the ideological message was we are Israeli poets writing in Russian only because that's a transition repeated. We have no connection with Russia whatsoever. Our audience is not in Russia, our audience is here and there will be moment that we will fully forget Russian and start writing in Hebrew. This moment never arrived because bigly yaki. That's my opinion. I'm curious what other people would say. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you indeed. All right, and uh, the last question from Denis Sobolev. Uh, yeah, once again, it's not a question. I just want to support what Marina said. 
uh, because uh, uh, I've been for years uh, a member of the editorial board of the 22, which was uh, uh, probably the most important Russian language uh, uh, literary journal in Israel for decades. Uh, and uh, as, as it seems, uh, this phenomenon uh, Marina described of the of, of, of an extreme tension between the ideological position and the actual command of Hebrew was quite uh, how to say this uh, uh, it, 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 it wasn't something that was related to Gendalf specifically uh, uh, quite a few people from the same generation of the 1970s and 1980s who claim to be Israeli philosophers, writers, and intellectuals. The Hebrews, as Marina said, Hebrew, as Marina said, was uh, uh, rudimentary or just a little bit above rudimentary. In contrast to the next generation, who, who, whose Hebrew uh, is fine and sometimes even perfect, and still they. Uh, 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 they do, don't embrace this ideological position. So in this sense, there is almost a complete shift from, from one direction to another one. And uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, when you said rudimentary, I thought I, I, I'm familiar with quite a few people like this uh, from the same generation uh, Gendalf was. And uh, this is probably was one of the sources of the internal conflict of the generation. Bet uh, between the, the actual command of language and the very, uh, 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 how to say this, uh, not too profound, let, let, let us put it like this, not too profound uh, familiarity with Israeli realities and the self-understanding as Israeli poets or Israeli writers or Israeli intellectuals. And uh, this was a sort of a source of tragedy. Yes, and it's interesting, if I might add quickly, somebody just a few sessions ago, Raman, remind me who was it, somebody like in our round table, in our work group said, we speak Hebrew at home all the time. It's like the language that we are writing, like dissertation on, that we are professionally working on. So it's interesting for us to write in Russia. And when I constantly ask the question, where is the audience? And a lot of people said the audience is in Russia. That they like Denise, you know, who is absolutely fluent <laughs> in Hebrew and actually, you know, is the head of the, the department of, of contemporary literature. Not anymore. Is. Okay, I'm done with, it, uh, with the chairing of the department. You know, writes novels in Russia and publishes them in Russia where the audience is. Basically, right now, the Metropolia is the audience, although the identity, social identity in Israeli. And at that time, it was completely different. There was a completely different social shift, which is now even funny to remember, although it was just 30 years ago. And the last thing that I want to say, I think one of the like envies that that, that, that Gendelev had, and you know, saying to what like Professor Katsu said, I basically I decided to do this presentation because I was one of these young poets who was the member of the Gendelev circle. You know, and I, I know I know Misha personally very, very well. And I remember how bitter he was about Brodsky, how bitter he was about like you know violent genius and the early 90s. Then suddenly Brodsky became so popular in Russia, although it's basically an American poetry written in Russian. And Gendelev was not able to achieve it at all. And he felt that it's exactly because of his identity, that Brodsky lack of identity helped him to gain something that Gendelev couldn't because Gendelev had a preset identity. All Isn't right, uh, we, have to, we have to end our session. And thanks a lot to the presenters for, for the brilliant presentation. And really, they are. And thanks to all the participants for the questions. And now in seven minutes, so please be here again for the next session. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.